A dramatic reconstruction of a real police investigation into a brutal murder now on BBC One. Another case from the Crime Watch file. What have we got? Can't get in contact with their daughter at the cottage. Uh, she didn't turn up for work today. Roger, will do. Look, you're going to have to break down the door. Are you sure you want me to break down the door? It's going to have to be the front door. Yes, yes, I'm concerned for her welfare. My son-in-law keeps a lot of cash. Well, there are cars here. They can't understand. You see, she didn't turn up for work today. Look, I'll take full responsibility. Just break down the door. OK, Rob, do it. I just remember standing there and... Just, just this quietness, complete and utter quietness. All, you know, they were talking, but they just didn't seem to hear that. It was just absolute dead quiet. And that's when I knew there was something really wrong. And I knew then that she probably was dead. Sir, I think I have some bad news for you. I believe your daughter may be dead. And, um... I think it was the dread we'd all had in the back of our, our minds ever since that uh, we'd arrived at the cottage. There was something really desperately wrong. And then I remember just being hustled out of the house and walking down to the police station about 50 yards down the road. And then just sitting there and then, which seemed to be ages, and just sitting and waiting. And then they came in and said something about guns and they're being shot and then after that everything seems as if we were sort of as if it was some sort of film and we were just watching but somehow or other we were involved in it <laughs> Police have started a murder inquiry into the deaths of a couple at Wadhurst in East Sussex. The bodies of a local businessman, Harry Fuller, and his wife, Nicola, were found last night when police broke into their home. Both are thought to have died of gunshot wounds. The police say Nicola and Harry Fuller were shot between 8 and 9 o'clock on Wednesday morning, a time when the street outside their cottage was particularly busy. About 10 hours later, the police found... I think that was the hardest bit. You know, you go down and see your mum. It's not so bad if it was a road accident. But when somebody's been shot in the back, it's very, very hard. We found the body of Harry Fuller downstairs in the utility room and Nicola Fuller upstairs in the main bedroom. Harry Fuller had been pulled into the utility room and white powder of some sort sprinkled over his body with a little sachet, uh, which it appeared to have come from, laid down beside the body. That was uh, certainly, I think, intended to give the impression that this murder or these murders could have been drug-related. We caused that to be examined and very quickly found out that it was, in fact, sucrose, which is a sugar compound. Um, and uh, despite an enormous number of inquiries, looking into the suggestion that this could be drug-related, we were quite happy at the end of the day that this was not a drug-related murder. Just outside that utility room, we found a cartridge case a fired case um, which looked as though it had been fired in a 3-2 self-loading pistol. Initially, uh, we found that Nicola Fuller had been shot four times, uh, three times uh, probably while she was carrying down on the landing, uh, the first floor, and subsequently a further shot after she'd stumbled into the bedroom. See which service do you require? We quickly discovered that a 999 call had been made from the house uh, on the morning that the murders occurred, uh, and we were able to time that as being at 8:43 in the morning. 
This call was recorded at the 999 centre where the line was left open for a total of six minutes. Thinking it was a child playing on the line, the operator said, is mummy there? Shortly afterwards, Nicola was shot a fourth and final time. We could hear in the first 17 seconds Nicola screaming and what sounded like a muffled retort. And from that point, we could hear footsteps, drawers and uh, single movements from the uh, telephone. Took a lot, it must have taken her a lot to get from where she was to the phone. A lot of effort to get there and then not have it, you know, her phone, the, the call put through. I think the, the nightmares that you have are of the fact that somebody desperately needs help. I know that she crawled a long way, she got to a phone, she managed to dial 999 and nobody came. And that keeps you awake at three o'clock in the morning. Night after night. After the post-mortem and the detailed scene examination, we had a little bit more to go on. There were five uh, bullets recovered and one cartridge case which was uh, taken from the folds of Nicola Fuller's dressing gown. Now, the cartridge case was uh, made by uh, Hurtenberger, which is a, a fairly unusual make. Um, it had been fired in a Walther self-loading pistol. This shows the rifling marks on the nose of a 3.2 caliber bullet, uh, which would be designed to weaken the nose to make it open up on impact. Detectives say they're now building up a picture of events at the Fuller's Wadhurst cottage on the day the couple were killed. A neighbor has now said that she did hear shots at about nine o'clock on Wednesday morning, although at the time she didn't realize that's what they were. Police believe it's likely that Mr Fuller knew his killers, or killer, as neighbours say he wouldn't let anyone in he didn't know. And they think the gunman probably left by the back door of the house after shooting the couple. Police say they're convinced that he was seen by passers-by. Excuse me, uh, I'm the manager of Lloyd's Bank, and I think our security video might be of some use to you. What does the video show, sir? Well, it looks across the street, so from the front of the bank, to the sweet shop on the other side. I knew the man particularly as a customer who came in here occasionally to buy cigarettes in the mornings. Mm -hmm. uh, in a village like this, you, you tend to notice people. In fact, that Wednesday morning, he was here at about 8.30 when the school kids were here. The videotape that was handed in by uh, Lloyds Bank was clearly very significant because it, uh, from the shot from the camera, it overlooked the main high street which is in fact a main road through from East Sussex into Tunbridge Wells. At the time that the murders were occurring, it was extremely busy and there were literally hundreds of cars in, in stream going in each direction. But it did mean that we had on tape at least the movement of vehicles and subsequently we actually found uh, the uh, picture of Harry Fuller going into the newsagents, which was directly across the road from Lloyds Bank. That's him, that's the man from the cottage. I'd recognise him from the length of his hair. And that's at 8.34 that morning? That's right, that's the man I sold the cigarettes to. You're Today, sure. Nicola's parents face the press in the hope that their voice would encourage people to speak up. <clears throat> On Wednesday of last week, our beloved daughter was brutally murdered, together with her husband, Harry. <clears throat> Whoever killed Harry, Nicola was an innocent witness. I think we blamed Harry for what had happened because he'd put Nicky in a... A dangerous position but that time we hadn't got anyone else to blame it we'd got to vent our anger out on somebody I was surprised when she wanted to marry Harry but I didn't feel that she'd known him long enough I tried to persuade her perhaps to leave it a few more months perhaps but she was adamant and I couldn't couldn't persuade her one way or the other she just wanted to made up her mind and that was it Nikki was very quiet and shy and a very reserved person. It, it took a very long time to get to know Nikki, but if you were her friend, you were her friend for life. Harry was very charismatic and he treated her very well. He 
treated her like a lady. He always opened doors for her. There were always fresh flowers in the house. He was always buying her little, silly little presents that he would bring home when he, they hadn't been out working together. And he was, he was lovely to her. He had the gift of the gab, Harry did. And Harry... No, Harry wasn't a villain. He was just clever at his job. He, he had expensive cars, Rolls Royces, and Range Rovers, all the top cars. Harry could earn good money. And he, he enjoyed money, he enjoyed life. Harry Fuller was a very colourful character. He, um, he he's, he's referred to by people as a con man. He, he was, uh, in some people's minds, unable to tell the truth. Sir. Here's a tape with a threatening phone call on it, the one that seems a crime officer found. You've heard it? Yes, sir, it was on the answer phone. It sounds like that guy, Colin, really means the business with Harry. Hello, this is Waterhouse 784501. I'm sorry I can't take your call at the moment, but if you'd like to leave your name and number, we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Hello, Harry, it's Colin. I'm going to come over tomorrow morning and we're going to have a serious talk about what you did to me tonight, because I'm pretty pissed off with you and you're going to pay for it. See you later. Colin turned out to be a, um, a, an ex-business partner of Harry Fuller's. Uh, they'd been involved jointly in buying and selling motor cars. Um, we uh, f quickly traced him and we were able uh, to determine that that call on the answer phone had in fact been made before Christmas the previous year and related to an incident when Harry and Colin had a falling out in Tunbridge Wells. The lifestyle that Harry Fuller led meant that we had enormous a number of lines of inquiry to follow through. He told many, many lies to many, many people, and most of those people related those stories to us. We were absolutely weighed down with a wealth of information, some of which we subsequently found out was not true, much of which we found out was an exaggeration if it had come from Harry's lips. So, for example, if uh, he had told somebody that he had £40,000 in his pocket, the probability is he had £4,000 in his pocket. Oh, good enough, then, mate. <laughs> oh, there's plenty more where this came from. I got 350000 in the attic back home. Only a few days before the murder, Harry had come into possession of £13,000 in cash, in the majority of which was £20 notes. £20,000 for you to start the business. Oh, thanks, love. So what I'll do is, I'll get it going, using this as capital, we buy in the cars, we sell them on, split the profits, yeah? God bless you. And we were quite sure that some of that money should have been in the house at the times of the murders, and we never found it. Fairly early in the inquiry, we heard about uh, Harry Fuller having uh, come into possession of a, a rung motor car, a, for want of a better word, stolen motor car. How have you done? Any joy? There's word about. Apparently, Harry was involved in a ring car. Got quite messy, I understand. Messy? What sort of a dispute was it? Well, a BMW was sold to Harry, but the engine and number plates were changed. Apparently, he shopped them to the local police. The word is, it could have been a grudge killing. So, do we know who sold him the car? We've got some names, but we need it to... It led us on to a particular inquiry, um, which eventually went nowhere, but it was an example, and that was one of many, many similar inquiries of the uh, red herrings, if you like, for want of a better word, that were being thrown up because of the way, the, the lifestyle that, that Harry Fuller followed. Cash? In twenties. And we'll contact you at a later date. Hello, incident room. What did you say your name was? Steve Young. I'm an associate of Harry Fuller. Do you want me to come down and make a statement? And what did you do? Uh, I arranged insurance for him. I see. Well, it won't be necessary for you to come down. Someone will be in touch with you. Today, flowers on the doorstep are among the few reminders of the death of Harry and Nicola Fuller. They were killed by a small calibre handgun. Despite an intensive investigation, detectives still have no idea who pulled the trigger. They believe the answer could lie in the sometimes dubious business dealings of Mr Fuller. Ten days into the investigation and police were still searching inch by inch through the cottage. This thoroughness was rewarded when they found a machine used to record telephone calls. We recovered the G-Mark tape and we were quickly able to establish that the calls made on it had been made during the previous two days and the majority of them the previous evening. Quite why Harry Fuller had done that, 
to this day we don't really know, but uh, for some reason he had decided to record a selected number of phone calls coming in on that, on that day. And of all, those in, of all those phone calls, we were uh, able to eliminate out every call except for one, which was from the man who uh, gave his name as Steve. Can you take All right. About eight or something like that? Yeah, no problem. No, no problem. Eight. Where, where are they? He's gone away. He's left them with his missus. Where are they? So, down the other side of Roberts Bridge. Well, can you come over to me? Yeah. You're a gentleman. So, we'll zip down there. It won't be long. It'll be about, what, 10, 15 minutes? Right. You're a gentleman. Right. Don't let me down. How are you doing? Very well indeed. It couldn't be better, Steve. I popped over last night. Didn't we decided to play the tape to the two families um, because we wanted to identify the person, Steve, um, and we uh, hoped that either um, a close relative or an associate of Harry Fuller's, or indeed Nicola Fuller, would recognise the voice. And I expected something that sounded very sinister or very strange or very odd, but it was just a very normal telephone conversation arranging to meet Harry in the morning. And it was only after a couple of days when I actually started to realise the implications of that, that that was who was going to be at the cottage at 8 o'clock on the Wednesday morning. Will you run through all the Steves for me, please, Bob? Fine. We had by then, I think it was 85 persons of the name Steve that had already come into the system. Some who were close associates of Harry Fuller, some well, who were not, action each some who had come in in some other context. And as each day went by, uh, it's a, a fairly common name, and as each day went by, that number increased dramatically. There's two police officers here to see you. Oh, can I help? I'm DC Fulcher. This is DC By. Hi. Just a few questions about Harry Fuller. You knew him? I um, did some insurance for him. How long have you known him? I met Harry, uh, let me think now, about 1981, and we lost touch. And about May, June last year, I ran into him in a pub near here. Was he a friend of yours? <laughs> the only dealings I had with him were insurance. No, uh, I couldn't call myself a friend of his, no. When was the last time you spoke to Harry? I think it was the Thursday or Friday, the week before he died. He called me about his insurance cover note. It was about to expire. Were you anywhere near the murder scene on the morning of the 10th? No. It's just routine. Where were you on that morning? Here, working. I'm sure my secretary will vouch for that. How's the business? Well, it has its ups and downs. It's uh, solvent. It's doing well. Is there anything else at all you can add to help the inquiry? No. How many students have we talked to so far? About 12, probably. Sir, so the fax has just arrived from BT, confirming the change of phone number at Blackness Cottage. Um, Harry Fuller had actually changed his telephone number, I think, on three occasions. The last time being uh, the previous week to the murders. And this meant that only a, a limited number of people uh, were aware of his most up-to-date phone number. How are you doing? Very well indeed. It couldn't be better, Steve. I popped over last night to see you. How are you doing? Very well indeed. It couldn't be better, Steve. I popped over last night to see you. What time? The police asked us to look at the Harry Steve call and isolate Steve's voice with a view to playing it for information. Um, we actually isolated Steve's voice and enhanced it without altering the voice information. It should be remembered that his voice was excitable or sounded excitable, and, uh, but people's voices do sound different over the telephone due to the telephone system and the answer phone recording system. And so it wouldn't have been easy, unless you knew him very well, to recognise that voice. I popped over last night to see you. I popped over last night to see you. Initially, I um, decided to hold the tape back in the early days, um, hoping that we could uh, trace the person concerned and get to him without giving him prior knowledge of the fact that we had that tape. Uh, that didn't come about in the short term. And so I made the decision that I would seek the widest publicity for that tape that I could get, and f for that reason went to Crime Watch. The day of, uh, of Crime Watch couldn't go fast enough. We, we pinned so many hopes on the, on the programme because we thought that the police had come to a dead halt and this was the only way that they would get a breakthrough.
all day. I was watching the clock, waiting for the time to come that it was going to be shown. Um, we just paced up and down. We were thinking, OK, today's the day. They're going to find someone today. Somebody's going to know something. Somebody's going to have heard something. It was fairly obvious that anyone who recognised the, the voice on the tape that person was obviously um, a prime suspect. And of course, we were so hoping that somebody would identify the voice. This case is the callous murder of Nicola and Harry Fuller at their cottage in the village of Wadhurst in Sussex. The couple had only been married six months, and their families are finding it painfully hard to come to terms with the tragedy. During our reconstruction, you'll hear the actual voice of a man police are desperately trying to trace. How are you doing? Very well indeed. It couldn't be better. I popped over last night to see you. What time? That's Stephen. Yeah, I guess. I'm going to ring him. Yep. Hi, Steve. Are you watching Crime Watch? We'll put the TV on then. They're doing a reconstruction of the Wadhurst murders. They've just played a tape. The voice sounds like you. Did you ring Harry Fuller the day before you died? No. They may replay the same tape. OK. Welcome back to what's been a truly remarkable evening. If the calls we've had fulfil their promise, a very strong result so far on photo call and names that seem to fit on three of our four reconstructions. But I would appeal to anybody who may be sitting there thinking, I know that voice, please to contact us. Uh, obviously, we will follow all those calls up. I'm convinced it's Stephen's voice. I don't know. I'm not so sure. Stephen, was it you on the message? No, it wasn't me. You want to get yourself eliminated. Your voice is distinctive. I don't want you involved. Oh, OK, OK. Bye now. We've had quite a number of people coming forward telling us uh, that they knew Harry. It, uh, it went by in a blur. It seemed to go th so far, so quickly. And then all of a sudden it was over and we waited for the phone to ring and literally sat by the telephone, paced up and down, waiting for the police to phone us to say, yes, we found something, and it didn't come. Could I take your details, please, uh, your name? The voice is Steve Young. He lives in Pembury. Police have never found out who made this anonymous phone call, but several viewers recognised Stephen Young's voice on Crime Watch. Well, we had a, a large response, something like 160 or more calls, uh, of, of all sorts um, uh, uh, from, from the public. Um, I, was, I was pleased to get those calls, um, initially a little disappointed that um, there was nothing that one could immediately recognise of being, as being red hot, if you like. Uh, but the, we then had to, to go through the process of deciding how we were going to prioritise our follow-up inquiries in respect of those 160 calls. I was in Woodhurst on the morning of the murder. In fact, I believe that the voice on the machine may be mine. Last year, Harry had said if I knew of any good cars, he would like first refusal. One of my clients, a Mr. T.C. Smith, in fact, had a Porsche he wanted to sell. I gave the details to Harry on a number of occasions, but as far as I was aware, he never made contact. Gradually, as the price came down, Harry seemed to get more interested and suggested that I arrange a meeting so that he could see the car. It was about 8.20 when I arrived. I went to the front door and knocked, but there was no reply. Hello, can I help you? I have some information about the murder of Harry Fuller. I made a written statement addressed to two Sussex officers. It was my voice on the tape that they played at Crime Watch. I'll have to refer the matter to the incident room at East Grinstead. Are you willing to wait? Mm -hmm. You can go if you wish. No, it's OK, I'll wait. Your friend might be a while. OK, OK, I'll see you later. Yeah. By this time of the inquiry, the man Steve was very significant. We knew that the man Steve was either our murderer or the man 
who was at the scene of the murders when they took place and would therefore be a very vital witness. We had two anonymous calls giving us the name Stephen Young. In fact, we were on our way to interview him when we got the information from Tunbridge Wells that he was there having given himself up for interview. I just ask you this, if the tape hadn't come to light, never played on Crime Watch, you never told us about it, would you? Well, probably not, no. No. Yet you're at the scene. You're the most vital witness possibly. Yeah. Now you come to light. Yes. After nine weeks. Yes. Are you a graduate? Um, no. No, but you went to, you're quite well educated, aren't you? Went to uh, Skinner's Grammar School, uh, Tunbridge Wells. Mm, a good school. I just find it uh, curious. Mm. Uh, you're obviously a law body person, mm. that after nine weeks, and only because of the pure chance of the mm. tape coming to light, mm. that you've come to see us. Uh, well, yeah. Is there anything you want to say about that? The thing was, I hadn't seen anything or heard anything which I thought would have been assistance. You don't know what would have been assistance, though. The image we had of Stephen Young when we left no, no, no. to go and interview him was a man who had some prior knowledge of the criminal fraternity a man who had come into contact with the police before and had been subject of some form of investigation. In fact, we found exactly the opposite. We found a man who had never been interviewed by the police for anything ever before. I just wanted to sort of get, get it out of my mind and not, not get involved or, or be in any way involved with it. What sort of car do you own, can I ask? Uh, what sort of car do you take round to Wadhurst for do that morning? I I think it was probably the Gulf. Can you be sure? Yes, I think it was. I think it was probably the Gulf, yes. Now saying I think isn't sure, is it? Um, it was the Gulf. What other cars have you got that you can use? Well, at the time, at the time I had a um, blue Jetta, um, but it would have been the Gulf I would have taken. And what was the colour and registration number of it? It was um, white. And the registration is C for Charlie, 61 Golf Kilo Echo. Do you hold any firearms or any firearms certificates? Uh, yes, I do. What firearms certificates do you have? Um, a firearms and a shotgun certificate. I, um, I have one shotgun, um, one uh, 45 pistol, one 9mm pistol, one 22 pistol and a 38 revolver. Are you a member of a gun club? Yes. Which gun club? Uh, that's the 41st Kent Home Guard Rifle Club and uh, I'm also the treasurer as well. We decided to arrest Stephen Young because during the course of the interview he readily admitted that he had been at the scene of the murders when the murders took place. He was a holder of a firearm certificate and by his own admission had weapons at his disposal. And it was because of these points that we decided that there was enough there to arrest him for the murders of Harry and Nicola Fuller. When they mentioned Stephen Young, it's a bit strange, because I know the guy from the pub. And you think, oh, hold on a minute. He lives just down the road. And they got Stephen Young for murder. Twice, he's, he's shot two people, cold-blooded. When I heard the name Stephen Young, I was, uh, couldn't put a face to the name at all. The name meant nothing to me. So I went and looked it up in the telephone directory and found out that it was a local man. Um, but then I couldn't put a face to it, and it was so frustrating that I now had a name of someone and yet couldn't picture who he was. When we questioned Stephen Young, it was a softly, softly approach that we adopted for the simple reason that if we could keep Young talking to us, it would enable us to check what he was saying with Mrs. Young, uh, facts that we were finding from the search teams who were out searching his home address in his office at the time we were doing the interviews. What were your finances like January, February this year? Pretty grim. Or were they... Uh, tight, put it that way. Were you financially viable or were you starting to go down the pan? No, I think... I think... we were in... Um... We were probably trading insolvently, I would think. The search teams were hoping as much that they were finding uh, various pieces of evidence from all the locations, which were then fed to us at the end of each 
interview which would enable us to go back into the next interview with a new uh, topic until we had everything that we could possibly have out of Stephen Young. So who do you buy your ammunition from? In the main, um, David Lawson um, gun shops. Uh, also, I reload. What does that mean? Well, basically, it means that instead of paying six fifty or seven pounds for fifty rounds, you uh, collect the empty cases, you uh, decap them, you clean them up, you reprime them, and then you reload them. And basically, by keeping the case, you're cutting down on the cost of each round. So you buy the gunpowder or something, do you? Yeah, you buy the gunpowder, you buy the primers, mm. uh, you buy the various bullet heads. Do you have the facilities to do this at home? Yeah, yeah I've got a, um, I've got a uh, small press, yeah. The reloading equipment that uh, Stephen Young had was very basic. And from the markings present on the bullets and the cases, um, his reloading technique was very poor. The uh, markings that were generally produced on uh, the, the bullets and cases on Stephen Young's reloaded uh, uh, bullets and cartridge cases looked to be the same type as those that had been uh, uh, put onto the bullets and cases at the murder scene. We're going to talk about cars. Cars that you own or cars you have owned. Like the white Golf, white Golf GTI? Yeah, yep. Registration number C61GKE, yeah? Mm -hmm. Where is that now? Um, that is at a garage in Norfolk. Oh, do you know the name of the garage? Yes, uh, the Polka Road Garage. Stephen Young owned a Golf GTI, which was a most unusual car. It uh, had a lot of modifications made to it, which made it virtually unique. On the day that Crime Watch uh, was publicised, uh, the 15th of April, um, Stephen Young had taken that vehicle to Norwich um, for some work to be carried out on it. Um, that may be a coincidence. The Golf GTI was fitted with a mobile telephone. Um, when we uh, ran some checks on the numbers made, the call num calls made from that telephone, we discovered that at 8.10am on the morning of the murders, uh, a call had been made from that phone to the Fuller's house. Hello. Hello. Yeah, it's me, Steve. Where are you? Yeah, I'm out back. I'll be down. Just give me 15 minutes. Yeah, put... We knew from the start that the Lloyd's video could contain some vital evidence, and therefore at an early stage, we set out to make a detailed log of all that was on the tape. Following the arrest and the initial interviews of Stephen Young, we went back to the tape to look at it again, to look for Stephen Young's car, which was a white VW Golf. He'd said in an interview that he'd driven it to the cottage that morning, arriving at about 8.20 a.m. and leaving at about 8.40. However, on looking at the tape, we were unable to find the car around the times that he'd stated. We therefore extended the search to look either side of those times, uh, whereupon we found it quite easily. It was quite lucky for us that it was a white car and that it, it had been partially customised because that made it distinctive and made it easy for us to pick out on a black and white film. Sergeant Allen, Saunders. Sussex police now needed confirmation that it was Young's car that had been spotted in the video, so they filmed it being driven past Lloyd's Bank on Wadhurst High Street. The copy of this yes, tape, um, together with the original Lloyd's video, was sent off to Geoffrey Oxley at Colourgate Imagery Bureau for his expert analysis. Righto, John, we'll have the first picture from the bank on. Yep, you can see the uh, alloy wheels there stand out very well. Can I have the picture that was taken by the police reconstruction still from that? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, you can see those alloy wheels stand out very well. Um, can you put them together, John? OK, yeah. You can see those special alloy wheels they've got there, plus the air intake on the bonnet. And look at the way the wheel stands out there and down here as well. Incredible. Yeah. I think that's pretty conclusive, really.
After Young's arrest, we searched both his office and his uh, home address and recovered a, a huge amount of property and paperwork. Amongst the paperwork, we found a £6,000 paying in slip, which showed that uh, £6,000, almost entirely in £20 notes, had been paid in the day after the murders into the account of Young and Harding. Uh, bearing in mind that by then we were already aware of the £13,000 given by the lady to Harry Fuller ten days before the murder, and the fact we hadn't found that money, um, that was very important. At this stage, Tony Wrangles, a senior fraud squad officer, was drafted in to unravel the complexity of Young's finances. Mr Young's financial position was quite desperate. He had been using clients' premium funds uh, for his own expenditure. His position was critical. He was under a lot of stress. He was under pressure from the insurance companies to make payments of money that he'd already had, but spent. Um, he couldn't raise the funds. He was being pressured that uh, his brokerage would be cancelled by the insurance companies and he would be closed down. His business would fail. Um, he was under extreme pressure to find some money. Have you got the account? I'm working on it. November and December are still outstanding. You'll get it. Right then, I'll be back. Yes? Hello, is that Mr Young? I'm calling from the Provincial. Yes. I'll be calling in on Wednesday to collect the account. Yes, OK. Immediately prior to the murder, um, Young's bank accounts did not hold the money that he had promised to pay to the provincial insurance company. He made out a cheque on the Wednesday and he postdated that till the following day, the 11th of February. Um, he had to pay money into the bank, otherwise the cheque would not have been met and in consequence the provincial would have cancelled the agency. His business would have failed. And where did that money come from? That was from home. From home? Oh, what sort of denominations was that in? Um, that was the money I'd been saving up. A couple of years ago, a um, client uh, and a friend of mine lent, lent me some money, uh, about £6,500. £6,000? £6, £6,000, yeah. In what denominations? I think I, I've been keeping mainly... Uh, 20s, mainly, yeah. You've been keeping 20s? But where did you keep that money? In my safe. Oh, work or at home? At home. During the course of the interview um, that he was having with the police, um, he gave the explanation that the £6,000 in £20 notes had been saved over a long period. Um, this seemed really totally inconsistent with his financial position. How's it going, Tony? It's going really well. Um, there's no way that uh, he'd save that £6,000. It's just not possible. Everything tells me that uh, he was so desperate for money. It's uh, no way did he save it. And we can prove it. Oh, it's all on the paper. Every piece of paper is telling me he was desperate. Hello. How are you? Um, you don't know anyone who could lend me, say, ten, twelve thousand pounds on a long-term basis. Uh, someone's let me down. I can ask around for you, but I don't have that sort of money, Stevie. He had uh, approached a number of friends uh, and other clients. Uh, he even kept a record of those people that he had approached and given a story that uh, he needed money for particular uh, matters. And uh, he kept a list and wrote on that list what the answer was from each of his friends. We first became aware that Young was a family man during the course of the interview at Tumbridge Wells. He made a big point of saying that he was a family man with two children and he took his children to play football. He was also a member of a drama club in which his family was involved in as well. So he gave the Edward impression that he was very much a family man. Why is there a loaded 9mm handgun in your children's bedroom? Um, I can't answer that. No, there must be a reason for it. Who put it there? I would have. Why? Um, I couldn't keep it in the cabinet because it's not a um, legally held weapon. No. Why in your children's bedroom? That's question one. Question two, why is it loaded? Question one first. Um, well, if it's where I thought, uh, where I've just said, um, 
I consider that to be a secure place. In your children's bedroom? Well, underneath the bed. Underneath the bed? How old are your children? Ten and eight. Ten and eight. They haven't got the run of the bedroom. They can't do what they like. Well, they do. I mean, they don't go diving around underneath the beds or in the drawers or No, like there's that. always a chance it could do, isn't there? Well, yeah, there's always a chance, yeah. There was question two there as well. Why is it loaded? Uh, I can't answer that. Is there something sinister that you can't tell us about? No, there's nothing sinister. So, as my colleague said, why is there a loaded weapon in your children's bedroom? That's loaded. Who loaded that weapon? Well, I would have. When we questioned Young about the loaded Browning automatic pistol recovered from this child's bedroom, Young remained calm. In fact, he remained so calm, it was ice cold, and we nicknamed him from that point on as the Iceman. It just appeared to Young that every family kept their guns in the child's bedroom. It just seemed an everyday thing that didn't bother Young one way or the other. By this time, the team were confident Stephen Young was their man. They managed to get a 24-hour extension to hold Young in custody so they could question him further. Point three two ammunition. What ammunition of that calibre do you have? I haven't got any three two ammunition because I haven't got any three two guns. What the... Although I do believe I have reloaded some. I did reload some for somebody um, in the club, but that's going back a wee while. You don't have a point three two. Why else would you have three two in your house? Because I can tell you now, some has been found. Unless it's the remnants of the stuff I reloaded. What make of 3-2 would that be? I don't know, because I don't... I don't... I didn't even know I'd got any there. I think you do know. Well, you're going to tell me it's HB, I suppose. I'm going to tell you. I think you ought to remember. Because I think you used several rounds on Wednesday the 10th to kill Harry and Nicola Fuller. So you have another think. It's not that long ago. Harry and Nicola Fuller were killed with point three two Hurtenberg ammunition. Yeah. Right. In your loft, there is point three two Hurtenberg ammunition. Right. There's a lot of ammunition there. Tell me about it. Tell my firearms expert about it. Yeah. Hurtenberger. I don't know how common it is or anything. I just know it was used to kill Harry and Nicola Fuller. A gun produces fingerprint type of uh, Im marks on uh, bullets and cases. Uh, these markings of various types uh, are specific to a particular weapon. After looking at the, uh, the bullets and cases very closely in association with the reloading equipment, I came to the conclusion that, uh, the, uh, that there were bullets and cartridge cases in Stephen Young's possession that had been fired in the same weapon as the bullets and cases at the murder scene. The thought that somebody who would be not only a business associate but a friend because you'd let them into your home and you'd give them a coffee and sit and chat with them, that they could turn around and kill you to take your money is horrific. Stephen Andrew Young, you've been charged that you on the... I found it hard to believe that somebody that was their insurance broker would have access to guns, let alone that he could commit such a crime. It didn't seem to fit the character of the sort of person you assume an insurance broker to be. But then, what is a murderer like? What job do they do? I didn't do it. The murder weapon used by Stephen Young, the author of PPK, uh, was the, the least likely of uh, choice for a murder weapon when you compare it to the weapons that he had on his firearm certificate. The fact that it was traced to him was down to some very diligent and uh, detailed police investigation uh, who traced the source uh, of that particular weapon and its connection with uh, Stephen Young. The gun used to murder Nicola and Harry Fuller was never found. Documentation from a mail order company in Derbyshire proved that Stephen Young had purchased a Chinese-made copy of a Walther PPK in 1988 and, in contravention of the Firearms Act, had sawn off the barrel. A single nickel-jacketed bullet found in Young's office matched perfectly the bullets used to kill the Fullers. 
A jury at Hove Crown Court has been hearing the final moments in the life of 27-year-old Nicola Fuller. They've been played a tape recording of a 999 call she made... At one point there I was convinced he wouldn't get found guilty of the murder. I mean, you know, it could go one way or the other. Um, you know, you give it to 12 people and you could find that some find him guilty, some don't find him guilty. Guilty of murder, the man who shot a young couple for their money. It was a strange feeling the day that uh, he was convicted. Um, we suddenly had to realise that nothing would change. Although he was, he was off the streets, he was a very dangerous person now behind bars, there was going to be no change for us, which still wouldn't bring Nicky back. But we certainly were relieved that there was no chance of him walking down the street again. Graham? Yes? Wasn't that Fuller's murder case yours? Yes. Well, have you seen the front of the News of the World this morning? No. But what's the News of the World got to do with the Fuller case? Well, it's all over the front page. Killer to appeal over murders of Nicola and News Harry follows Fuller. newspaper reports claiming that during their night at the hotel, jury members held a seance to contact Harry and Nicola Fuller to ask who killed them. If successful, an appeal could result in a retrial or Young's conviction being quashed. Well, we decided that uh, after the trial we needed to get away. The holiday was to, to get ourselves back together and, and to sort of sort ourselves out where we were going when we got back because we'd sat for a year and we'd done nothing. And then to get off the plane and be told that there was an appeal pending. Um, we came back and we were back where we started nine months previous to that, which was, I don't think, I don't think we felt that we were going to be able to get through it. When uh, I heard, and when the team heard, that on uh, uh, the basis uh, not of anything wrong with the evidence, but on the basis of misbehaviour by some of the jury, that the matter had to be tried again. It, it, it was frustrating, in the, it, it, to put it mildly. I also felt very disappointed for the relatives of the two Judge. families who, having sat through one trial, I had then to face up to sitting through a second trial. Nicky, because we can't afford it's it. Trace. We're in a murder case. We get no legal it's aid. turned to a Ouija board case. That's what they're referring Mr Young was delighted with the uh, Court of Appeals decision to allow his appeal against conviction, and um, he and we will start now preparing for the next round, which is the retrial at uh, the Old Bailey. Mr Young was remanded in custody until his new trial, which isn't expected to begin for several months. Uh, the feelings at that time were just despair, I think. Um, feeling that uh, it was a nightmare and you'd wake up and uh, it sort of wouldn't be true. And you think to yourself, what's happening? It just, it's just so hard. Some believe it, my parents, oh, they're just gutted. They couldn't believe it. To think this man, we know it is the man but for the evidence we've had. And he's got retrial on a silly, silly thing. The jurors' use of the Ouija board meant that eight months after the first trial, the families of Harry and Nicola Fuller had to sit in court a further three weeks, listening once again to all the evidence, not knowing what the final outcome might be. Don't let me down. Very well indeed. It couldn't be better, Steve. Good evening. A double murderer whose original conviction was overturned because jurors had used a Ouija board was convicted again today and given two life sentences. A new jury at the Old Bailey found insurance broker Stephen Young guilty of shooting a couple... When I today. think about that, that just he'd gone in there and killed them for money, and that when I think that she... when she was on the phone and she turned round and she could see his face and that was the last thing she saw, his face, before he shot her again. Many things bring her back, her favourite songs, um, if somebody shouts out Nicky or if um, somebody shouts Mum, brings it back. She loved the sun um, and she would come over and come home from work and get into any little bit of sun that she, she could get in. And when I sit out there in the garden now and the sun's shining, I think, you know, I can see her there in the lounger. 
She may have her head stuck in a book, but at least she was there. And... So many times, a hundred times a day, I want to pick up the phone to her. I think, oh, I must tell Nikki that. And she's not there. But I don't accept that she's not there. I have to accept that one day I'll see her. And I get through each day on the strength that one day I'll be able to ask her how she is. <laughs>